So welcoming uh, from across the pond there, Eric, uh, the small pond, not the big pond. Uh, oh, sorry, Andre Eric. <laughs> how, how did I kind of get Hello. you mixed up with your surname? Sorry, Andre. <laughs> no problem. Uh, yes. So, Andre, you are going to take us to the dark side uh, or yes, something. More Too much Star Wars or... <laughs> okay. So, low code and the dark side. I'm really uh, thrilled to hear this presentation. Take it away. Thank you so much. So everyone, great to be here. My name is Andre, and when I'm not taking care of a little puppy named uh, Salvador, I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Encore. Before that, I was a staff software engineer at Spotify, where I focused on backend development and systems design. And to talk briefly about Encore, it's a backend framework that makes it easier to create modern backend APIs. It more than doubles developer productivity, and it does so by analyzing the code you're writing and understand how your application works. And then we use that to simplify many parts of the development workflow. Encore automates many parts of the development process that have never been automated before. And in this way, we let you focus on what makes your product unique. And I'm here to talk about the dark side of low code. And what do we mean by that? Well, let's start by talking about productivity. And the way we think about productivity, it's uh, essentially two parts. And these are related to how differentiated the work is. And by differentiated, I mean something that creates value that is unique to your product. And of course, this is something we want to do as much of as possible. So the first part about developer productivity comes from how can we reduce the amount of time we spend on undifferentiated work? And for the second part, where we're working on differentiated value, we want to do, of course, as much as that as possible. Then productivity becomes, how can we do that work faster? And as we'll see, there have been many improvements to many parts of the development process, but most of that has been on the undifferentiated work. And very little has been on the, the second part, how we can move faster when we do differentiated work. And the first area that we'll look at is how we run APIs and software in general in production. And so at first, there was the data center. We, we purchased servers, we got them shipped off to a data center somewhere, we hooked them up in racks, we wired them up, configured them and brought them online. And finally, we could run our software. And lead time was measured in weeks or even months. And if we had a hardware failure, we had to do it all over again. And then on March 19th, 2006, everything changed with the launch of AWS. And the cloud era brought like a much more powerful abstraction for running software with the introduction of EC2 and S3 and other fundamental services. And this was incredibly powerful to, now we no longer had to wait months just to get a server up and running. And next we had the platforms. Uh, platforms as a service is a higher level abstraction than the cloud. And initially these were distinct products from the cloud itself. But nowadays, the cloud providers offer many different services of varying levels of abstraction. And finally, the most recent introduction was containers. So containers is a way to package essentially any application in a unified way. And this enabled us to create even higher level abstractions like uh, Kubernetes, for example. And if we look at this, these are uh, this has been an evolution that has gradually increased the abstraction level and that has made it easier and easier to run software in production. And this has improved developer productivity a lot, but it's all in the category of how can we do less undifferentiated work. And within this, it's important to remember that since this has been very gradual, 
even if you use containers, you might find that they're very constraining in how you use them. Um, but with this evolution, there's always been a way to drop down in abstraction level and use something that is slightly more uh, flexible and offers you more power um, if you find that the next level of abstraction has been uh, too limiting. So that's how uh, running software in production works. But what about the process of actually developing APIs and developing software? So the first step we did in this uh, evolution to improve our productivity was to introduce libraries. So libraries are like these buildings over here. If you do the same thing over and over, libraries make it possible to reuse functionality, just like how we have blueprints that make it easy to build the same building many times over. And this was great. And then the next step in the evolution was more libraries. Over the past decade, the library ecosystem has exploded. And nowadays it's easier than ever to find a high quality library that solves a common problem and you can just import it into your application and keep working. But they come with a, a quite a big limitation, which is that they don't really support uh, specialized infrastructure of any sort. So if you have some functionality that requires special hardware or particularly uh, tricky infrastructure or storage or anything of the sort, it's very difficult to package that up as a library. So uh, then we come to the next step of the evolution, which is software as a service, or uh, as I like to put it, uh, libraries that are running on someone else's computer. And so the SaaS ecosystem has been uh, incredibly successful and it's seen incredible growth. And this has enabled us to outsource even more of these common pain points that every product is having. Uh, with the added benefit that you don't even have to run it yourself, you can just let the, the SaaS company handle all of the hosting. And so this was a, a shift from using libraries to having APIs to do a bunch of stuff. And that gets us to the final stage, which is uh, software as a service libraries. Um, and, and this is essentially, we've come full circle now where we took things that were libraries and we packaged them up as software as a service products. And then we found that now we have a bunch of APIs to call and that was a bit annoying. So then we created libraries to make it easier to use those APIs. Uh, and that's essentially all the innovation we've seen for many years in terms of like how we develop software faster. Uh, and when you think of it, all of these libraries and SaaS products, what they all have in common is they solve a, a common problem by definition, because if it's not a common problem, there is no market for them. So it's, it's actually yet another example of reducing time spent on undifferentiated work. So if you were interested in not just building a bunch of undifferentiated buildings like this, and instead wanted to create something unique like this, you know, this building is not like anything else you've seen. If you've been to Singapore, you probably recognize this immediately. But this is not a building that you can create by importing some libraries. And so libraries don't really help us if what we want to do is, is truly differentiated work. So what is it that we can do to actually help with this? We need better tools for creation. We need better abstractions for creation. And so this is where low code comes in. Low code is a new way of building software that works at a much higher abstraction level than the traditional way of developing software. And this can be incredibly powerful and let us create differentiated products very quickly. Uh, and so to better help illustrate that, 
let's uh, talk uh, macarons. Now, uh, I I'm not a chef, not even close. But if I were to make, uh, uh, if I wanted to make a, a really great and tasty dessert, and I was just handed these beautiful macarons and a, a nice stone plate, I could do a pretty great job. And loco tools are the same way. They make it very easy to do something that's uh, exactly the way you want it and uh, essentially lets you take a bunch of common functionality and package them up and ship it off. Um, and in that way, you can very easily create interesting things like this beautiful tower of, of macarons. Another way that low code is great is it helps you iterate and build on top of what you already have. Just like macarons makes it easy to build on top of each other. Another great aspect of low code is when you decide you've been working on something and you decide we need to pivot, we need to do something else. And you need to quickly rearrange your application to work differently than what you have. And low code makes it easy, just like macarons are easy to rearrange. And you know, as I was making this presentation, I had absolutely no idea how many different types of macarons there are and how they exist for every single occasion you can think of. Like Halloween macarons or wedding gift macarons or, I mean, just look at this. This looks uh, quite a mouthful, very scary and delicious. Or how about a wedding cake made out of macarons? Or what about this magical levitating macaron? And low code is the same way. It has great solutions for most occasions. And that makes it super fast to get started with. And as long as you're interested in working within these constraints, it is incredibly productive. And so at this point, maybe you'll stop me and say, hey, Andre, I like macarons, but I'm a bit fed up with them at this point. What about a, a hamburger instead? Now, if you're using low code, there's a solution for that. And it's called macarons. And so macarons are great if you're in the mood for macarons. And if you're not, they're, they're not so great. And this is the dark side of macarons. I mean, uh, low code. Because it turns out low code tools are very constraining. And as we've seen with macarons, they make it very easy to do things as long as those things fit in with how the tools have been designed. And when you want to venture out of that box, suddenly it becomes very difficult, if not impossible. And oftentimes, uh, low-code tools end up being too high level. And unlike what we saw with running software in production, they actually don't uh, allow you to drop down in abstraction level. Local tools are often all or nothing, where there's no middle ground. It's either you use the local tool to work at a very high abstraction level, or you're forced to drop down and do things the old way. And that can be very uh, limiting and eventually cause you to have to rewrite your whole application from scratch. And so paradoxically, even though local tools are designed to help you create differentiated value, oftentimes their very limitations uh, reduce 
uh, and limit your differentiation. And this can be a big problem. And when you talk with companies that are using low code, oftentimes they start out building a prototype and everything is great. And when you talk with them three years later, they're no longer using low code because they've had to move on and rewrite everything from scratch. Now, this is not an, an unsolvable problem. And in fact, there's a, a great analogy to another industry, uh, uh, the game engine and game development industry uh, that is doing very well with a similar abstraction. Game engines help you build games faster. And they later do that at a very high abstraction level, just like low-code tools. But unlike low-code, they enable you to build different parts of your game at different abstraction levels. So for example, uh, some parts of your game can be built by non-coders using a visual scripting language that looks like this, while other parts of the game are handwritten C++ at a very low abstraction level. And you can kind of mix and match for different parts of your game. So game engines offer both incredible productivity, yet also does that with complete freedom to make any type of game that you want. And so I believe that there's a missing piece if we go back to uh, code and low code tools. We believe that we to unlock true productivity without having to fear having to rewrite everything from scratch, we need to be able to choose the right level of abstraction for different parts of the system and be able to effortlessly move between a very high abstraction level to a slightly lower abstraction level down to a very low abstraction level as your requirements change and your business evolves. And this is what we're trying to do with Encore. And so to, uh, to wrap it all up, I think there are some considerations to think about when you're trying to build something and trying to decide, should we be using a low-code tool or not? And the first question is, how likely are the requirements to change? And if they're very likely to change, maybe a low-code tool is not the answer because you don't, you don't truly know if low-code tools will continue to work for you. Secondly, how differentiated is the experience? If you're building something that is totally unique, local tools might not fit and enable you to do that. They operate in a very well-defined way and that can be great, but it's not so great when it doesn't enable you to do the very thing that makes you unique. And lastly, can we afford a rewrite down the line if it turns out that local tools are too limiting for what we're trying to do? And if the answer is no, perhaps we shouldn't start with them in the first place. But if you're acceptable with these trade-offs, local tools can be a great way to build uh, uh, an application very quickly and help you focus on what makes your app unique. And finally, it's worth remembering to come back to the notion of productivity. And what we're really trying to do is to do differentiated work faster. And so it's up to you to figure out what is it about my product that is differentiated and do more of that and spend as little time as possible on the undifferentiated work. Thanks so much for listening. Uh, Please reach out to me on Twitter if you have any questions or would like to continue the conversation and check out Encore at Encore.dev. So thanks you so much, Andre. It was a really great presentation and, and I really liked the way that you kind of picked it apart that when, when should you do the low code solutions? And I think that a lot of it actually applies to no code uh, solutions where you might be doing something unique as a as a, a kind of software provider and you might yeah. go full code <laughs> but your users might then enjoy the no code or the low code approach 
I have a few questions to you from the audience. So June wants to know, uh, so low-code tool is not a kind of a good tool for optimization <clears throat> to the underlying infrastructure. What are the tools that you considered as low-code tool? Uh, and as an example, uh, there's like Node-RED versus Node.js or something like that. Yeah, I think there are, there are too many too many to count. Uh, I think a very common low-code tool is something like Firebase or uh, even AWS Amplify. But it's all it's all spectrum, right? It it's not like there's a, a clear boundary between no code and low code and and full-on code. Um, if that yeah, makes sense. I've seen even even. Um kind of Ruby-based things being used as, as kind of the low-code solution or lower, I don't know if, if it's a scale or something. But, but uh, I think that it's important for, for example, startups to understand that there is that rewrite cost. So uh, I, I've seen a lot of startups start with something that is essentially low-code or lower code, and, and then they kind of find out in one year that, oh, oh gosh, our business is scaling. We have to actually do something else. And then the yeah. investors are mad. So can you give any examples of, of kind of what you what cases you might have seen in the wild? What, what kind of uh, put you to give this talk and not some other talk. <laughs> I mean, it really is this, uh, it's really a, a call for, for trying to bridge this gap. And I think it's, it's, I'm trying to highlight that what we're really missing is the ability, to, like local tools are fantastic, uh, but they're, they're too limiting. Mm -hmm. And so we need, we need to keep all of that value, but introduce more flexibility in how you're using them. And that, that I think is the missing piece. Um, and, you know, there are many, as you say, startups that uh, use low code or, or even no code to build parts of their business, but don't have a way to, you know, keep using it for some parts and then take other parts and move them to a, a slightly more flexible approach. It's very much all or nothing. And that's the big, big downside. So that's... Yeah. Be very yeah. careful when you're starting out in in choosing based on what you think you will need. Yeah, and I I, I think that it's kind of like an attitude issue too because I, I've I've recently actually fought with some seriously great programmers on this kind of like we we were doing some no code stuff or like no code and and combined with low code to just to experiment because the business requirements were totally you know not ready. Nobody mm -hmm. really knew how the whole thing should actually work and what the audience response would be. So for those kind of cases, it was really cost effective to take tools that, you know, my, my marketing uh, people <laughs> could use themselves or somebody else that doesn't really know what to do from a coding perspective. But then the, the serious developers in the team were like, no, but we have to do everything in a very kind of a, um, like build once to make it last and build it properly. And I was like, yeah, but uh, there is this cost of like rewriting, yes. And, and But then there's the cost of if you are building the right or the wrong thing in the first place. And I think yeah. that that is an excellent point that your presentation was making that you have to understand who you are building for and why and how stable the requirements are because otherwise you will kind of just building some cost in the budget uh, without yeah. really knowing. I think it's the same with, with other uh, abstractions. Like yeah. when you start out with a new trend, people are very used to the old way of doing things. So there's a lot of resistance. Yeah. But over time, as it becomes more, more commonplace, people start to accept uh, this trade-off as, you know, when when the opportunity is right, when we have the right set of requirements, it's actually a, a much better way than yeah. the old way of doing things. Exactly. And, and it also depends what kind of developers or team you have to do it. If you just don't have the, the kind of heavy lifting coders <laughs> available at that point, maybe you can get by by just doing something with some, some tools that you have available. 
Thank you yeah. so much for your presentation, Andre. And uh, I think that we have addressed all the questions <laughs> from the audience. So thank you for coming and hope to see you again. And maybe if anybody has any questions to you, you can answer them later in the chat. Now we actually have a break coming in. So thank you, Andre, and we'll go to the break and then we will continue at four uh, EET. So that's three CET. And we will have, uh, let me check. We will have policy as code. So we'll move slightly to the security side and then we'll come back to API management. And healthcare and API is on stage two. And don't forget all the wonderful workshops and roundtables by the sponsors. Uh, make sure you'll attend those and check out the sponsor booths too on the break. See you in about 20 minutes. Bye.